everyone. My name is Tim Gillibrand. I'm a partner with Strigberger Brown Armstrong. And today I'm going to discuss uh, vacancy exclusions in residential policies. But before I start, I'll just take care of a few housekeeping items. First, a little bit about SBA. We're a full service insurance defense firm. We have 20 lawyers with three offices in Toronto, Waterloo, and London. Uh, myself, I have a pretty broad insurance defense practice with a primary focus on property claims, including subrogation, coverage, and a wide range of liability claims. I work out of our Toronto office, but I'm not really constrained by geography these days, and I work for clients throughout uh, the GTA and Southern Ontario at the moment. Um, during the, the presentation, if you have any questions, just post them in the chat. There's a Q&A chat at the bottom of the screen. I'll try to answer them at the end of the presentation if I can, and if not, I'll definitely uh, reach out to everybody and try to get you an answer. The seminar today is being recorded, so if uh, you know a colleague who would be interested and didn't get a chance to sign up or to make it today, just let them know. That should be up on our website in the next couple of days. Oh, and finally, uh, apparently my cursor is showing a little bit from time to time, so please uh, just bear with me there. Um, so again, okay, today I'm going to discuss vacancy exclusions in residential policies. And this is somewhat of a complex topic, which depends a lot on the policy wording. So I'm going to try to hit some of the high points and leave you with an idea of the key considerations when you're dealing with these types of cases. And so first, I'm going to just discuss briefly what I mean by a vacancy exclusion generally. And then we'll look at how the courts have treated vacancy exclusions where some of the key terms are not defined. And then we'll look at a different form of the vacancy exclusion um, where the terms are more defined and how that has impacted the case law. All right, so just to start off, I should touch quickly on what I mean by a vacancy exclusion. Policies will often have wording to the effect that there's uh, no coverage in certain cases where the insured property is vacant. Uh, the policy may also use other words such as unoccupied. And it's a bit of an oversimplification because it is a complicated issue. But generally, these exclusions are treated as applying to situations where nobody's actually residing at the property. And there's no standard form of vacancy exclusion in residential policies, which creates some difficulty when it comes to interpreting these clauses. So when do vacancy exclusions come into play? Generally, these exclusions come into play in situations where the property was intended to be used as a residence, and for some reason, it's not being occupied as a residence for a period of time. Uh, these come up, these types of situations happen regularly with rental properties, so where the tenant um, either hasn't yet taken possession or the owner's in between tenants at the time of a loss. And there's also many instances where the owners of the home have simply moved out for one reason or another. We don't see the exclusion coming into play too often with temporary absences from the property or uh, vacations or with seasonal properties like cottages. And you'll see as we move through the examples of the exclusions that these typically don't really fall within the typical vacancy exclusion. So I kind of alluded to this already, but generally speaking, there's two broad types of vacancy exclusion. First, some policies have um, just a broad exclusion clause stating that there will be no coverage where the property is vacant or unoccupied. And with these, I'll call these sort of the broader exclusion. With these broader types, terms like vacant and unoccupied are often just not defined at all in the policy. And this leads to a lot of case law on what those specific terms mean. The second common version of the exclusion usually says the property is not insured where it's vacant, using that specific word. And uh, the policy will contain a definition of the term vacant. And so with these types of policies, it's obviously more clear what vacant means, but there's a lot of case law that's developed and the fight usually becomes over how that definition gets applied to the specific circumstances and what some of the words within that definition really mean. Okay, so just to start off with what I've referred to as the, the broader uh, form of the exclusion. This is an example where the exclusion uses terms like vacant and unoccupied. In this example here, the, the form, sorry, the exclusion reads, the form does not ensure loss to property, which to the knowledge of the insured are vacant, unoccupied, or shut down for more than 30 days. So again, the 
the policy here does not include a definition of what vacant or unoccupied mean. So this is a pretty common example, especially with older policies. And over the years, the courts have had to determine for themselves what, what unoccupied and what vacant means. So generally speaking, I've tried to summarize how the courts have uh, developed these definitions on this slide. Generally speaking, unoccupied um, with these broader types of exclusions refers to situations when the property is not being used as a residence. And on the other hand, the term vacant um, is more restrictive and it applies to situations where a property is completely empty of, of belongings. So the two terms are actually treated quite differently at common law. And my, my general read of the case law is that when you're dealing with these older, um, broader exclusion clauses, the results in court tend to be less predictable and at times can favor the insureds more than when you have an actual definition of vacant in the policy. And this is really just keeping in mind that the insurer has the burden of proving that any exclusion applies to a situation. So if you've got a policy that doesn't define what vacant means, obviously that can lead to more ambiguity in the policy, which tends to favor insureds when you go to court. So just as an example of the, the broader exclusion and how it's been uh, interpreted by the courts, I've uh, got the case of Shane versus Meridian, which was a 2011 Ontario Superior Court decision involving an 85 year old lady who had a tenant at her, her property. The tenant moved out and then the lady started doing some renovations on the property and she was attending quite regularly. Um, several months into the renovations, there was a water loss, which was apparently caused by some vandals. The insurer denied based on the vacancy exclusion. Uh, and again, the policy had one of these broader exclusions, which didn't define some of the key terms. It just said that there's no coverage if the property is vacant or unoccupied. And so the court ultimately found in this case that it was not vacant, even though there was nobody living in the home. And I think this is, this is primarily because the policy didn't include a definition of vacant. So this gave the court more liberty to decide the case on its own facts. And the court commented that when you're uh, using these, these common law definitions of vacant and, and unoccupied, the analysis becomes very fact driven. And so in this specific case, the court really focused in on the fact that the owner did intend to rent the property to a new tenant eventually. And she was attending the property um, pretty, pretty regularly. I think it was almost daily. So in, in that circumstance, the court wasn't willing to apply the exclusion. And so again, really just shows that when you're dealing with these, these vacancy exclusions without definitions of the term vacant, it gives the court a lot more flexibility. And in this particular case, I think it was a fairly generous interpretation, even considering those common law definitions. But you'll see when we move into some case law where, where vacant is defined, that this type of result is pretty unlikely in those cases. So as another example of how the courts deal with these broader vacancy exclusions, there's an older case, uh, but, but often cited, the case of Lambert versus Wawanisa from 1945. It was an Ontario Court of Appeal decision. Here, the, uh, the insured had a farm in Ontario, and he had accepted a temporary job in Grimsby, which was a few miles away from his home, and he was staying in a hotel there while he did that job. And he would come back and forth from the home like every seven days or so uh, for a few hours to check in. And on occasion, he would stay overnight, but it was really just to check in on the property. And eventually, the, the home was destroyed by a fire while the insured was still living in the hotel in Grimsby. And this case had one of the broad vacancy exclusions, which didn't define what vacant means. And in contrast to the, the last Shane case, uh, the court found that the property was unoccupied at the time of the loss because the insured wasn't residing there and instead had taken up residence in a hotel. And even though he had visited the property, the court said that didn't make it occupied. And so it's a bit difficult to reconcile this case with the previous case, which the facts were pretty similar. The, the property owners were both checking in relatively regularly on, on the property, but it shows how much flexibility the court has when you don't define vacant. And you can also see how um, sympathy in these types of cases 
can drive the court's determination. And it's worth noting with respect to uh, the Lambert case that there were allegations of arson, uh, which could have been a driving force behind the decision. But in any event, when you're dealing with the broader form of the vacancy exclusion, the court results can be less predictable. So moving on, uh, the more modern approach seems to be for insurers to get rid of terms like unoccupied and just craft the exclusion around the word vacant, which then is defined in the policy. And this obviously helps us understand more what it, what it means, what the exclusion means, but the debate gets shifted to how you interpret the definition of vacant. So on this slide, I've included two, uh, two common examples of a definition of vacant within a policy. The first example says that vacant refers to circumstances where regardless of the presence of furnishings, all occupants have moved out with no intention of returning and no new occupant has taken up residence. Or if you're dealing with a new build, no new occupant has yet taken up residence. Um, sorry, no occupant has yet taken up residence. And the second example, which I won't read, is very similar to the first, but it has some subtle nuances, uh, which you'll see in the case law. So the, the definitions of vacant are not standardized, of course, and they come in different forms, but generally we see three common features. So first, the definition tends to say that a property will be vacant if all occupants have moved out with no intent to return. Second, it'll be vacant if no new occupant has yet taken up residence or in some cases has not yet moved in. And for new builds, the, the building will be vacant after completion and before somebody moves in. I'm just gonna focus on the first two uh, during the seminar today, just because those tend to be the driving uh, features of the case law. So much of the case law on this uh, vacancy exclusion tends to focus on whether a person has moved out with no intention to return. And this is really two issues. First, whether they've moved out. Second, whether they have an intent to return. But the courts have found these are just, these are related concepts and you can see it in the decision. They are kind of decide, something that needs to be decided together. So the court usually deals with those as, as one issue. And generally speaking, um, courts have held that moving out means to cease living in a place. To move out without any intention to return connotes that it's a permanent act and the person does not intend to return to live there. But once a person's moved out, any temporary returns or visits to the property will not change the fact that the property has become vacant. And I'm gonna look at a few, a few decisions that focus on this specific issue. So first, there's a very recent decision from the Ontario Superior Court, which is Gregson versus CAA. Uh, this case involved an, an elderly lady who uh, developed dementia. She was living at her home until October, 2016. And then she went into a hospital and she was shuffled back and forth between the hospital and, her, and a retirement home. And while she was doing that, she had a friend who was checking up on her property every so often, but wasn't living there and wasn't staying overnight. And then five months later, while she was still in the hospital, there was a flood at the property and that resulted in $160,000 in damages. And CAA denied the claim on the basis that the home was vacant. And so this policy did include a definition of vacancy and the court focused on whether the insured in this case had an intent to return to the property. And the court said that based on the case law, the whether a person has an intent to return is an objective test. And so in other words, looking at all of the circumstances, the question was whether the insured had an objective plan to return to the premises as an occupant. And in this case, she didn't have any specific plans. The court gave an example of arranging for home-based care as something that might indicate a person has an objective intention to return to the property. And it, it didn't so much matter whether the insured really wanted to return to the property. In this case, looking at all the objective facts, she wasn't capable of doing so. And so there was no plan. So the property was held to be vacant and the exclusion was applied. And so you can see with a, with a policy that includes a definition of vacant, the exclusion gets applied a bit more rigidly by the court and there's less room for interpretation 
than with the prior common law definitions. So next, the case of Price versus Zurich involved a rental property. And this was a case out of British Columbia. I'll, I'll simplify the facts a little bit, but essentially the landlord served an eviction notice on the tenant. The landlord had an agent who went to the property and peered through the windows, I think, and saw that the, the property was mostly emptied out by the tenant, except for a few personal belongings, and it wasn't cleaned up. Prior to a new tenant taking possession, there was a fire that destroyed the property. The, the landlord's agent had sworn an affidavit saying he wasn't sure if the tenant actually abandoned the premises and maybe she'd come back to either get her belongings or to clean. And the court didn't accept that. Uh, they found that the tenant had clearly moved out before the fire and didn't accept that the, the agent believed that they might return. Um, there was simply no evidence in that case that the occupant had an intention to return, in particular to occupy the premises. So the property was considered to be vacant. And so this case highlights a couple of things. First, it's not so easy to argue that you didn't know the property was vacant if you're a landlord and it seems that the tenant has substantially moved out of the property. And second, even if the tenant comes back or is potentially going to come back to get their belongings or for some other limited purpose like cleaning, of course, we'll consider the property vacant if the tenant's basically substantially moved out of the property and living elsewhere. So there's clearly a bit of a trend with rental properties and vacancy exclusions. And we've got another example here with Nedjum versus Intact from 2016. Um, in this case, the insureds were turning their family home into a rental property. And in mid-2013, they moved out of the property and they had a tenant lined up, but the tenant ultimately fell through. They had a neighbor checking on the property, but nobody was living in it. And less than a month after they moved out, there was a flood caused by a frozen pipe. The insurer denied the loss due to, due to vacancy. And again, this, this policy included a definition of vacant, which required that the occupants had moved out with no intention of returning. And in this case, it was pretty clear that the insureds had moved out of the property and they never intended to return as occupants. And this was an important distinction. Um, it didn't matter if the insureds would return to work at the property or to inspect it they were never going to take up occupancy again. And similar to other cases, the inspections by their friends didn't change the fact that the property was vacant. So this case really highlights the, the difference between the two types of vacancy exclusions. The facts of this case are quite similar actually to the first case I discussed, Shane versus Meridian, where the, the owner was an elderly lady. She was doing some renos on the property between tenants and the policy didn't define the meaning of vacant and the court allowed coverage, even though there was nobody living on the in the property. In this case, the, the court was bound by the definition of vacant in the policy. And once it had found that the occupants had moved out and had no intent to return, that basically ended the inquiry. So there wasn't the same flexibility as with the previous broader form of the exclusion. Uh, next, we'll move on to the, de the decision of Peebles versus Wawanisa, which is another case out of BC. The facts are much more complicated in this case, so I'll, I'll try to summarize them as best I can. There were two friends who co-owned a property. Uh, one of the friends named Quinn lived in the house for a period of time with very few furnishings. In 2007, they talked about selling the property, and at that time, Quinn was he had moved out with his girlfriend but he left some belongings at the property, just enough that he could stay over essentially if he needed to. Uh, and Quinn also then eventually took up working in the Northwest Territories and he was back and forth between BC and the Northwest Territories to see his girlfriend. And even his, or even his mail was being directed to his girlfriend's address. And before the, the co-owners were able to sell the property, the house was destroyed by an exclusion. And there was a lot of evidence to support that there was nobody living at the property. Even, even after the loss, the insureds told their broker that the home had been vacant for eight months and that Quinn had moved out. So not surprisingly, the insurer denies on the basis of the, the vacancy exclusion. And the, the vacancy exclusion in that case included in the definition uh, that the occupants have moved out with no intention of returning. So I think 
in light of some of the other cases, this is a somewhat surprising decision. Um, the court found the property was not vacant in this case, even though Quinn barely stayed there and had admittedly moved out. But the court focused on the fact that Quinn left some belongings at the house. The utilities remained connected. The two owners kept checking up on the property. And also Quinn had in fact stayed at the property once within the 30 days before the loss. And also, even though Quinn was kind of moving around and stayed with his girlfriend and in the Northwest Territories, he didn't really have a clear established address other than the property. So again, it's a surprising decision um, since it appeared Quinn moved out. And I'm not sure if an Ontario court would decide it the same, but when you read the decision, it does start to make some sense. The, the court really focused on the fact that Quinn had been an occupant before, and he continued to stay to visit that property and stay there on occasion. And it's important that with these types of exclusions, of course, the insurer has the, the obligation to prove that it applies. And so the court here was just not satisfied that Quinn had no intent to return at all when it came to occupying the property. So they weren't willing to um, support the insurer's position and apply the exclusion with that unknown out there. So as I mentioned earlier, the policy definition also says the property is vacant after one occupant vacates the property and before another moves in or takes up residence. So whether someone has moved in or taken up residence, these are issues that come up, I would say less often in this type of a dispute, but they do lead to some, some interesting uh, case law and they're obviously important to know depending on your circumstances. So as an example of that, the, the Matic versus Saskatchewan mutual decision involved an insured rental property. The insured had a tenant who was ready to move into the property. And on one day, the, the landlord transferred the utilities into the tenant's name. The same day, the tenant brought over a few things and started painting the property, which was something that he had agreed to do in lieu of the, the rent for that month. The very next day, there was a flood. And this, by this point, the the tenant had not stayed at the property. All he'd done was move in a few things and started painting. And the insurer denied on the basis that the property was vacant. And in this, this policy in particular, the definition of vacant said, said that the property would be vacant until a new occupant had taken up residence, which was an important phrase. The, the court interpreted taken up residence very broadly and essentially said that a person can be considered as having taken up residence after they get possession of the property, but before they actually move into the property. And so the court here didn't mind that the tenant still had another residence. A person can have two, have more than one residences when you're dealing with interpreting this particular exclusion. So the case is helpful, but it doesn't really tell us exactly what taking up residence means. It just tells us that a person doesn't need to necessarily live in or have moved into a property in order to be said to have taken up residence. But, but based on the decision, there needs to be some right for them to reside in the property and possibly some positive action on their part, such as you know, moving in a few things or painting. In any event, here the, the vacancy exclusion did not apply because the new occupant was found to have taken up residence. And the final case I'll touch on is uh, Coburn versus Family Insurance, which is another uh, decision out of BC where apparently they have a lot of vacant buildings, <laughs> surprisingly. Um, in any event, this case also involved a rental property. And after the tenants had moved out, the owners started renovating and they did plan on renting it again. They were at the property frequently working on the renovations. And on one occasion they testified they even did sleep there um, although there was, there was no furniture in the property. Uh, the home was eventually destroyed by fire before the uh, renovations could, could get completed. But before that, the insured had actually entered into a, a rental, a verbal rental agreement with some, some new tenants. And the tenants had left some of their belongings at the property outside under a lean-to. And so the vacancy exclusion here, similar to Maddox, said the property would be vacant after an occupant moves out and before another moves in. So as opposed to using the language in Matic, which was takes up residence, they said before another occupant moves in. 
And the court found in this case, the tenants had not moved in. Simply storing some belongings outside was not enough to be considered having moved in. And this case, I think, sort of makes sense alongside Maddox. Both suggest moving into the property is something more substantial than taking up residence. So in this case, since the new occupant had not moved in, the, the home was vacant and the, uh, the vacancy exclusion was, was applied. Okay, so being mindful of time here. Um, just to sort of summarize some of the, the law in this area, um, obviously these cases are, are very fact-driven and it's, it's most important, I think, whether the policy contains a definition of vacant because this is gonna affect how the court interprets the exclusion. And generally where the policy doesn't define vacant, uh, the court results are more or less, sorry, less predictable. And I think can favor the insureds more, especially if there's a sympathy element to it. Um, if there is an overarching theme in the case law, the courts are most focused on whether a person maintains some sort of a connection to the property as an occupant. So if you're dealing with a case like this where you've got a vacancy exclusion that you think might apply, it's really important to get the exact timeline of when each occupant lived at the property. Uh, it's also potentially important to know when, when their contents were moved in or moved out of the property. But generally you should focus on whether there's any objective evidence that a person has plans to live at the property. And much of this, this evidence can be gathered by way of statement or EUO um, there's also collateral evidence that you can uh, obtain, such as uh, property bills and usages of, of utilities and that kind of thing. And obviously, of course, if you're ever dealing with a case like this, please feel free to reach out to myself or to one of our other lawyers. We're always happy to help with these types of things. So I'll look to the chat quickly to see if there are any questions. We have a few minutes left. Um, there's one question here that says, does it matter how long a property has been without residents? Uh, so I guess the length of time that uh, a property may have been vacant, um, it's a bit of a, a tricky question because it, it depends on the policy. If you're dealing with a policy where, where vacant is defined, then it really shouldn't matter how long the property has been without uh, an occupant because it's really a question of fact, was it or was it not vacant on the date of the loss. Um, it could matter whether the policy says that it needs to be vacant for a certain number of days before the exclusion kicks in. The situation is less clear when the policy doesn't define vacant, because in that case, you've got the common law definitions that you're working with of vacant and unoccupied. And as we've seen, the courts tend to take a, a more fact-driven approach to that. And I think there was actually one case where it said that the length of time the property was um, was without an occupant was a relevant factor in determining whether it was vacant. So um, again, uh, unfortunately for that, it does depend, um, but it, it could be a relevant factor. Okay, for the remaining questions, I'm, I'm gonna answer those. I'll reach out to everybody directly to, to answer those questions um, because we do have a couple, one more thing to take care of before we sign off. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars. We've been, uh, SBA has been doing these for the past uh, year or so now. Uh, we've got pre-discovery productions, uh, what gets produced and who pays. That's gonna be presented by Lindsay Roddenberg, a lawyer out in Waterloo. And she'll be doing that on September 16th. And then on October 7th, Krista Groen and Ariana Schrauen are gonna be presenting on Family Law Act damages following a recent case out of the uh, Ontario Court of Appeal in Moore. So if those interest you at all, please sign up if you're already on our, our email list. And if you're not, just reach out, we'll get you signed up. And please, if you have colleagues who are interested in those types of things, uh, let them know. We're happy to have as many people sign up for these as possible. So uh, with that, we'll sign off. And I wanna just thank everyone for joining and hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. <laughs>